Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson, your host from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries. Today, we're getting a head start on celebrating Earth Day, which is tomorrow, with an episode looking at orangutan conservation and the factors that influence orangutan diet selection. Before we take a bite out of this topic, thank you to the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camille and George Smith, who made this episode possible. Now, let us bring on uh, our guest, Leakey Foundation grantee and primate dietary ecologist, Dr. Aaron Vogel. Aaron, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for having me, Ariel. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Erin is joining us from New Jersey, where she is an associate professor in the Center for Human Evolutionary Studies at Rutgers University. Erin is co-founder and director of the Chuanon Station in Central Kilimanjaro. And um, hold on a sec, I'm getting a weird echo here. Oh, hold on a sec. One moment. Okay. Okay, I think that that should fix it. Okay, um, so uh, um, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so yeah, Erin is joining us from New Jersey, where she is an associate professor in the Center for Human Evolutionary Studies of Rutgers University. Erin is co-founder and co-director of Tunan Research Station in Central Kalimantan, Indonesia, an area that has one of the highest densities in of wild orangutans in Borneo. You can see some of the uh, the photos of this uh, amazing location. Before we hear from Aaron, uh, if you are watching this episode live, please post comments or questions in the chat and Aaron will be answering those questions live during the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely your question will be featured. Um, I'm really excited to have you on today, Aaron. We have had um, many adventures in the past. Uh, Aaron's given a couple of talks for the Leaky Foundation and um, uh, done tons of school outreach for us. And we actually had this really fun experience in New York. Uh, uh, her, it was uh, snowing incredibly much, like the day of her lecture at the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, we we got um, snowed in, and uh, yeah, we had fun fun times in in Central Park. <laughs> Navigating the uh, the park trails. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was just so fun. So I'm really, again, really excited to have you here. Um, and especially for an Earth Day episode. Um, Earth Day is just such an incredibly vital time to reflect on humanity's impact on Earth and how we can create momentum for addressing some of the challenges facing our planet. You work with Bornean orangutans who are critically endangered. What is the importance of orangutans and what do we lose were they to go extinct? That's a great question, Ariel. Um, as many people know, orangutans are the only living great ape in Asia and have many unique traits compared to the African apes. And what we do know about orangutans is that, is that they provide very important ecosystem services by dispersing seeds throughout the habitat. And they're also the largest arboreal mammals on our planet. So they're really important in a lot of different ways. And while research have been studying orangutans since the 70s, we still have so much to learn about them, including what triggers adult male bat by maturism, how do they survive these lean periods, um, and also why do they have the slowest life history of any non-human primate? And we're gonna, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. They're just so, so amazingly beautiful. How does orangutan conservation factor into your work and the work of your colleagues? And to kind of build off of that, why are continuous long-term field research sites important to primate conservation? Well, studying orangutans, I think we all become conservation biologists in one way or another. And one of the biggest conservation issues that are facing orangutans right now um, is forest fires, and particularly in peatland habitats like the one where we were. Um, in the research area where we are, forest fires have probably decimated about 20% of the study area in the last decade or so. And our current research is Tuan, at Tuanon is showing that these fires affect orangutan health, their energetics, and their behavior. 
Our fire team and our dedicated field assistants, along with our researchers, have really fought these fires over the last two decades. And with the help of the Leakey Foundation and the Leakey Foundation's young professional group, we've installed now over 100 fire hydrants around the forest where we work and within the forest. So in the dry season, then, we're more easily able to access these water. And this is a picture of the water pumps that we use to get the water actually out of the ground. Um, wow. These are the guys filling them up. And then in a minute, you'll see a video of what it looks like to actually pull and extract the water from about 30 meters below the surface, which we have to do in the dry season when there's no water. So you can see this is one of our cement hydrants and they're pumping the water now out. It's amazing. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms, in terms of our long-term research, it's also really important. I mean, I would like to say that our presence there and working with the local community as part of our research project has really given the opportunity, the force an opportunity to regenerate and grow back uh, from some of the prior fires and logging that, was taking place before we started the station. So this is what it looked like in 2003, um, and this is in 2019. So another thing is that in addition our, with our long-term data, we can really begin to look at life history patterns and aging in wild orangutans as they have really long inner birth intervals, and they don't even start reproducing until they're about 15 years old. Um, so we have so much to learn, and it's only through these long-term projects that we can follow the same individuals over time to really gain an understanding of their high survivorship and how they're able to exist through this fluctuating ecology that they experience. And these are some pictures of the mother-infant pairs that we study at Tuanon. Oh, they're gorgeous. Yeah, the uh, the Leakey Foundation uh, understands the importance of of really supporting long term research projects who are increasingly facing gaps in funding and unexpected emergencies. So we uh, started a program called the Primate Research Fund. We shared a link to learn more about in the chat. Please uh, check it out, especially if your site is experiencing circumstances like this. And if you're interested in helping protect vulnerable. Uh, primates long-term field research site and their local staff members, you can help by donating to the Primate Research Fund. And thanks to generous sponsors for Earth Day, um, all donations made will be quadruple matched. So we've shared a link to that in the chat as well so you can learn more. Erin, um, um, you work with a lot of local community members. What are the benefits with collaborating with local communities? There are so many benefits that I can think of, but I would say the biggest benefit is the local knowledge. Um, everyone we work with from the local community knows so much about the ecosystem, how it functions, the plants and the wildlife there, the water hydrology, and so much more. And we could never do the research we do at Tuanon without their insightful knowledge about all of this. Um, pretty much whenever we go in the forest, we go into the forest with our team of local assistants and we can't collect the data we do without them. Um, the other thing is with local, you know, with the local community is that since 2009, we've been also running our environmental education program in Tuanon in collaboration with Universitas Nacional. Um, and this has really been amazing for us. And I think for the local community members and school teachers as well, because they've really enjoyed the program. Um, our project manager, Achi Zulfa from UNAS, has helped a lot of these programs, bringing kids um, into the forest, along with other managers that we had of this program. Um, also building greenhouses uh, for the students and teaching them how to measure these trees. This is a picture of one of wow. the three greenhouses that we, we built so that kids could plant these, collect seedlings and then grow them in the greenhouses and then plant them back in the burnt areas. Um, so this has been really a wonderful experience. Um, we've also, this is As Achi Zulfa, one of our environmental education program managers and Tuanan partners. We've also had one of our um, graduate students who has worked really hard with a local community, Rebecca Britton, and she's been working to create the first English Indonesian Dayak Dictionary with the kids. And she started doing this with the kids um, before in the local community at camp before the pandemic hit. Um, 
and they got pretty far, but then they had to start again. So that's uh, one project we've been doing. Another thing we were able to do with the local community uh, as part of our project in collaboration with Universitas Nacional is build a school and a teacher's house. So the kids in the local community didn't have to travel as far to go to school um, every day. So we've been doing this and we're today we're raising more money to provide scholarships for the older children uh, from our village so that they can attend middle school and high school um, as we don't have a middle or high school near the village. So they have to go live in the city and pay for room and board and books and supplies and things. So we've been working on that as well and building up that program. Wow. I mean, you just, you do so incredibly much. I mean, you're the principal investigator at the laboratory for primate dietary ecology and physiology at Rutgers, co-director of the Tuanon Research Station and director of the nonprofit Core Borneo. That is a lot of hats to wear and, and that's just for your research. How do you balance it all? That's a great question. Sometimes I don't know. Um, I'm lucky <laughs> to say I don't do it alone. And that is for sure. I have an amazing group of collaborators in Indonesia from Universitas Nacional. Um, I have a wonderful group of undergraduate and graduate students from that are both Indonesian and from Rutgers and other places and postdocs, all of whom have contributed to this project. And, you know, sometimes I do find it hard uh, to balance raising a family with my husband um, and then doing my research in labs in Indonesia and research in labs at Rutgers. Um, but now that my kids are a little older, it's getting a little easier. Um, I would say, you know, being a professor at Rutgers can be a lot of work, um, especially with being grad program director and director of the center and, you know, having my family and, and, and uh, dealing with all those other activities, but it's a lot of fun and I have an amazing team and they all help me make it happen. Oh, I'm really I, lucky yeah, it, to have great collaborators. Absolutely. You know, I've, I've really always admired too, that you take such a holistic approach to your research. Beginning, when did you become interested in studying science? And what was your trajectory from there to now? That's a wonderful question. I ever since I was a little girl, I've always loved animals. And you know, my parents always remind me of that, that growing up in New Jersey, they used to take us to the Bronx Zoo and uh, to the Philly Zoo. Um, and I just always appreciated wildlife and enjoyed being outside. Um, and when I went to college, I actually studied birds. Um, in high school, I loved biology. I took AP bio. And then when I went to college at Colby College, I was really lucky enough to work for a professor as a research assistant and study birds, um, shorebirds and then forest birds and then tropical birds. And it wasn't until I was studying these birds in Costa Rica that I first was introduced to capuchin monkeys. And of course, how could you not fall in love with capuchin monkeys? They're really amazing. And so for my dissertation work with Charlie Jansen, who also studied brown capuchin monkeys, um, I went to the field and I studied diet and nutrition in white-faced capuchin monkeys. And it was only after my PhD uh, that one of my external committee members, Carl Van Schaik, um, who the Leakey Foundation knows very well, asked me if I wanted to do a postdoc with him looking at dietary ecology and nutritional strategies and wild orangutans. And that's how I got started at Tuanon. And I was really lucky um, to have this wonderful position and working with Carl Van Schaik and his wife, Maria Van Norvik, who co was a co-director at Tuanon up until recently. And um, doing this project with Maria and Suchi Utami at, Mo at MoCo and Tatang Mitra Satia, it's been a really wonderful and privileged experience. Oh, it just, it looks absolutely just so, so beautiful. Um, what is it like to work out in the field? What, what does a day look like? Well, we work in a peat swamp. So I'm going to say we normally start um, our research at about 3.30 in the morning and we go out into the forest. We meet our assistants usually in camp if they haven't spent the night at the station. Um, sometimes they stay in the village and come in. And we depart at about 3.30, 4 o'clock, depending on how far the orangutan nest is uh, from the day before. We typically walk in the dark. Um, and once we reach the next location, 
once we get to the forest. So this is us getting actually to the field station, these pictures. So we have to take a boat to actually get to our station, but then we can go into the forest. Uh, we have walkways throughout the forest to help us get in there quickly, uh, relatively quickly. And, um, you know, typically around six o'clock in the morning, orangutans will come out of their nest and um, they'll urinate and we'll collect their urine and then we'll follow them all day long and we'll monitor and record their behavior every two minutes. So this is my one of our assistants, Sui, collecting a urine sample on a stick with a plastic bag. Um, and then we'll pipette this into a tube and then freeze these samples when we get back to camp in our solar freezer. It's usually pretty dark when this happens. As you can see, this is the, it's just starting to get light in the forest. Wow. And he's pipetting the urine now into the tubes. Yeah, that's And our cool. assistants are really good at it. This is one of our uh, past students that worked at Tuana and Daniel Nemanko. And everybody gets really good because this is part of the standard data collection at Tuana. So everybody collects urine samples in the morning. It's, it's really special and, and really wonderful. And we can learn a lot about orangutans, which I'll talk about to you in a little bit. Well, as you said, you'll be talking about that in just a little bit. But first, we are going to give you all an opportunity to test out uh, your skills of uh, identifying um, what uh, orangutans might like to eat. So um, the way this will work is Aaron will share a photo of two food items that orangutans eat. You will assess which of these two food items you think that orangutans prefer to eat. Uh, there are, will be several rounds, so be sure to submit with each assessment which round you are guessing for. So um, let us uh, look at our first round. Let's see here. So so Aaron, what are these? So these are uh, two different fruits that the orangutans eat. One is called, we, the local name is Camunda or Leucocampus calicarpus. Um, and the other is called Tutup Kabali, is the local name, the local Dayak name. Uh, Latin name is Diospirus areolata. Ooh. So um, so now you, all of you viewers out there can guess which one you think that um, that orangutans prefer to eat. It's a, it's a, I don't know. They both look kind of tasty. But I would assume that that my tastes are, are different than an orangutan's Let's see here we have we have we, one guest one of the yeah one of the things we do ariel which is pretty cool is we actually try all of the foods that the orangutans eat so afterwards i can tell you which i think tastes better but that doesn't necessarily mean that the orangutans think it tastes better <laughs> okay so we have um okay one for uh, the uh kamuda and then we've got several for the tulip to, uh, not tulip, um, the <laughs> tulip kabuli, uh, kabali. Um, so, Aaron, which is the correct answer? Well, based on our data, it seems like orangutans have a much higher preference for tulip kabali. So, when it is available, they go after it. That's not to say they don't eat the kamunda as well, because they do eat kamunda year round. And one of my students is studying this and seeing that it's pretty much a staple resource in their diet. Personally, I like the taste of the kamunda. They're kind of like sweet peas. Um, mm. Whereas the tutup kabali is, for me, is only good when it's super ripe. Otherwise, it's kind of chalky tasting, but they seem to like it when it's not ripe and ripe. So. Oh, okay. clearly I have a different taste than they do. <laughs> okay, so now let us move on to round two. So just like the first round, submit which item you think orangutans prefer to eat in the chat. And again, remember to um, enter the uh, round you are answering for. So what are these, Erin? So the first one is rambutan, which some of you may be actually familiar with because you can get dried rambutan in Trader Joe's. And in some supermarkets, I've seen rambutan fruit. Um, the other is called akar parika, which is a vine or liana that the orangutans also uh, feed on. Ooh. So now let's let's see what, what our viewers think. We are getting, well, 
to be getting some responses very shortly. They both look, they both look, I feel like they both look kind of tasty. Well, I'm not going to give it away. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, people are, are starting to, let's see here, uh, Rambutan. We have another Rambutan. Oh, uh, we have one. Okay. It seems like the majority of people are saying that the Rambutan are are the preference. So which which is the answer? The correct answer is Rambutan. Okay. <laughs> now we will go on to our third round. So we will actually be pitting our winners from our first round and our second round against each other to see which comes out on top as the orangutan's uh, favorite food item in this uh, quiz. So uh, now between uh, the Tutu Kabali and the Rambutan, which do you think is the favorite food item? Aaron, uh, I'm guessing that uh, orangutans eat uh, uh, quite a few different food items. How many different food items have, have you recorded them eating? So if we're going to talk different food items, I'm actually working on this right now with my graduate student, William Aguado. And what we've found from our database, which is a, you know, 17, over 17 years of data, is that overall they feed on over 750 different species food item combinations. So from a given species, they can actually feed on three or four different food parts, like bark and leaves and fruit and flowers so they have an incredibly diverse diet and i'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment okay so now we have some answers in we have a lot for uh rambutan we have three for oh, oh we got more more for rambutan we have one for uh tutup kabali which is the correct answer so this is a tough one um, because I've been thinking about this back and forth, and I think that they spend more time feeding on Tuchip Kabali than the other than Ramutan. But I'm going to just add this caveat: it's also that the Tuchip Kabali is more abundant in the habitat. Yeah. So it may okay. just be that they spend more time feeding on it because it's more available. And I will say that when Ramutan is fruiting in the forest, it goes extremely quickly. So okay. when it's there, they find it and they eat it. So it might be a tie, but they spend more time feeding on Tutip Kabali, but it's also more abundant in the forest. Okay, well, we we, we had only one person guess that. So H. Gregory, uh, you have won. <laughs> uh, I, oh, we should have had a prize for this. I feel like we should. I won. <laughs> Maybe we'll try to find him some Rambutan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Supermarkets. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so now let... <laughs> Uh, so I'm really excited now to hear about more about uh, orangutan diet selection. Um, and thank you all for participating. This was just a really fun activity. Um, before we turn the virtual floor over to Aaron, though, if you are enjoying this episode, please be sure to subscribe and click the little bell to receive notifications wherever you watch Lunch Break Science. And you'll be the first to hear about upcoming episodes and more. So now let's turn the virtual floor over to Aaron and hear more about her research. Well, thank you. And I'm really, oops, let me make sure I can do this. Okay, I see where it is. I'm really excited uh, to share my research with you and to talk about kind of what we can learn from orangutan nutrition and physiology, physiology about our own health. And a lot of people ask me, why orangutans? Orangutans split from the human lineage about 14 million years ago, which is far longer than chimpanzees and when they split. But through my research, what we've realized is that humans have a lot in common with orangutans when it comes to health. And in, in fact, what we found is that in an energy rich environment, just like humans, orangutans have a really strong propensity of gaining weight and building up body fat compared to other ape species. So this is mostly in captivity though, where this has been found. And perhaps this is because the forests of Southeast Asia are characterized by this feast and famine ecology. And what we see is that there are these periods of high fruit availability and low fruit availability, but it's very, very unpredictable. 
And so if you are a large frugivorous mammal living in these forests, you really have to figure out what you're gonna do during these episodes of scarcity. And it has been hypothesized that these are the types of environments that our ancestors, also that early hominids um, also evolved in. So today I'm gonna talk to you about how this unique ecology um, affects the dietary strategy of orangutans and the physiological adaptations that we see, and ultimately how this influences their health. And right off the bat, it's really interesting, like we've already discussed, orangutans have a really diverse diet. At our site at Tuanon, they feed on over 200 species alone, and many of these species, we have about 60 more that are unknown that we don't have Latin names for. And they also feed on, as I mentioned, over 700 unique species parts. And this is almost three times as much as chimpanzees uh, as, that are studied as part of the uh, Kibali chimpanzee project in Uganda. And what we see is that during the high fruit period, orangutans really spend about 75% of their time feeding on fruit, but they do supplement their diet with leaves and other food items. But it's really during this low fruit period that we see a transition from fruit to an increase in leaves and vegetation and especially bark. But this has physiological consequences. Orangutans actually at our site, we see a 50 per, over a 50% reduction in caloric intake during this low fruit period. And earlier work by Dr. Cheryl Knott found that this also has physiological consequences. For example, she found that during this, the high fruit periods, orangutans build up their fat reserves. And during the low fruit periods, they burn fat as evidenced by ketone bodies in their urine samples. And ketone bodies are produced as a byproduct of fat catabolism. And more recent work by Herman Ponser and colleagues has found that, orang that orangutans actually have a reduced total energy expenditure compared to the other great apes. Orangutans here are uh, in green, so pongo, compared to gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. And they also have a reduced resting metabolic rate as well. In another study recently, Narita and colleagues found that orangutans have duplications of pepsinogens genes, which presumably facilitate protein digestion. And both of these studies suggested that these are unique adaptations to this very interesting and different um, fruiting ecology found in Southeast Asia. In our work, we're really interested in exploring what's called metabolic flexibility. And this is the ability of an organism to switch adaptively between different fuel substrates with changes in the nutrient supply, so the supply of nutrients coming in, and their demand. And it's become a really important framework for understanding the adaptive capacity of physiological systems to environmental variation. And it's also metabolic flexibility is a key adaptation in humans as well. So as Ariel mentioned, we, we collect our data at the Tuanon Orangutan Research Station located in central Kalimantan. And since 2003, we've been studying about 130 habituated individuals. And we collect, we calculate daily nutritional intakes when we do nest to nest full day follows. And we also are able to quantify the availability of fruit by monitoring phenology plots every month. And we have about 2,500 trees that we monitor every month for fruiting and flowering and new leaves in these plots. And we wouldn't be able to do this research without my, the co-directors of the station, Dr. Suchi Utami at MOCO, Dr. Tatan Mitra Satia, both from Universitas Nacional, and Dr. Maria Van Norvik from Zurich, University of Zurich. And in addition, we have an incredible research team of full-time staff, um, fire team staff, and our field assistants, and also all of the students that collect these data as part of the standardized data collection at Tuanon. Now I've mentioned we look at nutrition and a lot of people ask me, how do, you, how do you look at nutrition? Well, what this means is we often have to climb the trees that the orangutans feed in. We then collect the foods that they eat and we process them in our laboratory. 
And what we then do is send them out. We process them in the camp laboratory, I should say. And then we send them out to a lab in, Jaka in Bogor, the Leapy Lab, with led by Dr. Rosa. And she sends us back basically a nutritional fact sheet for everything they eat. And then we can combine this with our long-term feeding data and our daily feeding data to calculate macronutrient and energy intake. We also, as you saw in those videos, collect urine samples every day, and we can look at a whole lot of different factors, biomarkers of health and energetics in their urine samples. So what you can see and what I've showed you previously, this is food availability at Tuanon, fruit availability, I should say, from 2003 through 2021. And what you can see here on this graph is there's a dotted orange line, and that line represents the average fruit availability. So immediately what you can see is that there are a lot of months during the year when fruit availability is low, below that average. And in 2000, after the 2015 fires, we saw 36 continuous months of low fruit availability. So what have we found in our research in terms of their nutritional strategy? Well, what we find is that orangutans tightly regulate protein. And what that means is that there's much less uh, variation in protein intake between high and low fruit periods than we see um, in non-protein energy intake. And non-protein energy um, is made up of carbohydrates and fat. So here you can see there's a lot of variation in non-protein energy and very little variation in, the, in protein. But what we do see is that there's quite a bit, a big percent change between the high and low fruit periods, high and dark blue and low fruit here, and the ratio of non-protein to protein energy between these periods. Now, we can ask the question, do humans also maintain stable protein intake like orangutans? And the answer is yes, they do. In fact, what we see is that uh, work by my colleague and my collaborator, David Robinheimer and uh, Stephen Simpson has shown that humans also show this pattern of protein regulation, very similar to what we see in frugivorous primates like orangutans. So what about their energetics? Well, individuals, we can, we can think about energetics in terms of positive and negative energy balance. And this is pretty clear cut. When individuals are taking in more energy than they're burning, than they're expending, they go, they're in a positive energy balance and that's when they gain weight. Similar to us, if we take in a lot of calories and we don't do anything or we don't burn off these calories, then we're gonna gain weight. It's a simple equation. And when individuals are in a negative energy balance, so they're expending more energy than they're taking in, they're gonna lose weight. So what we found at Tuanan is that during the high fruit periods when caloric intake is really high, they take in more carbohydrates and more fats and they're over consuming calories. And during these periods, it looks like they're storing fat. But during these low fruit periods, what we're finding is they take in much lower carbs and calories and fat, but protein stays about the same as I showed you. But what we do see is a, more, a greater reliance on body fat for energy. And they're actually starting to use body protein, so skeletal muscle, for energy via the gluconeogenesis pathway. And work by Dr. Caitlin O'Connell in my lab um, and other students and collaborators has shown that these wild Bornean orangutans at Tuanon across all age sex classes are um, experiencing muscle catabolism, so skeletal muscle breakdown during these low fruit periods. So from high to low, we're seeing skeletal muscle wasting. So for the twan on orangutans, what we're seeing is that when carbohydrate, total non-structural carbohydrate, gets below about 3,800 kilocalories, we see that orangutans are using external or exogenous non-carbohydrate energy sources and internal lipid sources. So endogenous fat reserves. But below 800 kilocalories, this is when we really start to see muscle wasting as evidenced by an increase in delta N15 isotopes. So how are these wild orangutans adapted to low fruit periods? Well, we see a lot of adaptations for efficient energy acquisition during the low fruit periods in orangutans. Work by Ponser and his team has showed they have reduced energy expenditure relative to other primates, 
low re and low resting metabolism. And our studies have shown they actually don't move as much during these low fruit periods. We also are seeing clear evidence of gluconeogenesis of amino acids that are providing glucose to supplement energy metabolism, which helps them maintain their insulin secretion. And it may be that when they're breaking down this body muscle for energy as well, that it may reduce the cost of maintaining the metabolically active muscle tissue during these low fruit periods. But what that does mean is they also have to build it back up during the high fruit periods. And they're able to do that by increasing their movement. So they exercise more and they just eat a lot more. The question we're asking now is, are these episodes of caloric restriction actually harmful? And this is work that Daniel Nemanko did as an undergrad in my lab, and he's continuing as a doctoral student at the University of Colorado Boulder. And to put it briefly, what Daniel has found is that when individuals are over consuming calories, so past about 4,000 calories and definitely past the average intake highlighted by that blue line there, they have an increase in oxidative stress as measured by 8-OHDG in urine samples. And what this means is that oxidative stress is balanced by antioxidant production in our bodies. And when you have higher oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species in the body or in the blood circulating throughout the body, what we end up seeing is this oxidative stress or oxidative damage that is associated with cellular, with DNA damage and aging and several other diseases such as diabetes and obesity and cardiac diseases as well. And what's really interesting is that what we see in the Tuan and orangutans is that when they're experiencing this oxidative stress during periods of high caloric intake, they're also experiencing inflammation. So greater inflammation as well. Now, what does this have to do with longevity and survivorship? Well, what studies have found on birds is that species that have higher levels of oxidative stress live for shorter periods of time. And what we know in orangutans is that work by my colleague Maria van Norvik and colleagues has shown that they have about a 95% survivorship at, until the age of first birth in orangutans. And this is really high compared to other apes, great apes like chimpanzees and gorillas shown down here, and even some human populations shown here uh, with the purple line and with the box plot. Um, the, they're pretty close to Swiss people. Um, survivorship of Swiss people, which is shown with this yellow line at the top. So perhaps we're thinking about this wrong and that these episodes of caloric restriction are actually very beneficial for orangutans. And there's some studies in humans that suggest this. And so maybe these metabolic adaptations for low energy throughput combined with their metabolic flexibility are really helping them uh, survive and adapt to this fluctuating ecology that we're seeing. So are humans like orangutans? I would say yes. We're both very susceptible to fat retention in energy rich environments, and we're both adapted to a feast and famine ecology. The only, the only issue here is that orangutans in the wild move out of that energy rich environment quite constantly and fluctuate in and out of it, whereas westernized humans do not as much. So on that note, I'm gonna end my talk. I want to uh, dedicate this talk and this research to one of our staff members who passed away this week, Awan. Uh, he's worked with our project for over 15 years. Um, and we're really sorry and sad to, to hear of his loss uh, this week. So I wanna dedicate our work to him. And I also wanna acknowledge our amazing field team and all of the students and postdocs and colleagues that have worked to make this happen and this research happen. I also wanna thank all of our funding sources, including the Leakey Foundation that has funded us several times on these different projects. Um, we couldn't do this work without that funding. And on that note, I would love to go through this chat and answer your questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Erin. That was an amazing talk. You know, as you mentioned, now let's get uh take some questions from our viewers. If you are watching and haven't submitted your question for Aaron, be sure to get those questions into the chat right now. Our first question comes from Ian. 
Uh, Ian asks, are there any differences in conservation efforts for phalanged males versus unphalanged male orangutan? That's a great question, Ian. I think that our conservation efforts are really focusing on the entire population and the entire forest. So in our view, if we can help protect the forests and the habitats of orangutans, then we can also protect the forest for all the other really critical uh, organisms that survive in these um, habitats. In terms of flange versus unflange males, these are both adult uh, morphologies of, uh, of, the, of, of adult males. Um, but we have different frequencies or, or, or abundances of flanged and unflanged males at different sites. So at Tuanon, for instance, we have a lot more flanged males than we do have unflanged males. But at one of our sister sites in Sumatra um, called Swak, they have more flan unflanged males than they do flanged males. So it's really interesting to think about what's driving this. And there's so much unknown still. Um, and this is work that a few of my colleagues has been work have been working on over the past few years. And some work that my former graduate student, Didi Crosetio, who's now at Universitas Nacional, has also been working on. Fascinating. Oh, um, yeah, I, I definitely like keep us posted on 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 the research that comes out on that. Um, definitely. Let me see here. Who is our next? Our next question comes from H. Uh, H asks, can you tell us a little bit about how the pandemic affected activities at your site and what is the current situation? That's a great question, H. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was just leaving Indonesia. So I was leaving Indonesia. It was early February um, and it was actually hitting in the U.S. before it was really hitting in Indonesia. Um, but soon after, I'd say starting in March is when we decided to get collectively uh, with our Universitas Nacional co-directors that we had to shut down research and all the foreigners had to leave um, the Indonesia and come back home. And so all data collection at that time stopped. However, we did not stop employing all of our staff and our field assistants. Uh, we had plenty of work to do in camp and plenty of data to process in camp. So everybody just came in every day and started working on pictures and data input and data analyses together. Um, we did not start following the orangutans again until after the vaccination started to be distributed. So it was only recently um, I think probably in May of 20, uh, 2021 that we started going out again and following the orangutans. But what we did do is survey uh, prior to that. So we went out just to check on individuals. We Everybody had to wear masks out when they were um, in co or coming close to the, or following an orangutan. And we just wanted to identify when they were giving birth um, and who was in the area and who we could find. So really we were just doing surveys and now we're collecting data again, but we still don't have foreign researchers at the site, but the site has been maintained and data collection has continued with all of our wonderful UNAS students and Indonesian colleagues that have been, and um, our project manager in Indonesia as well, and our field staff. So we're still able to collect data, which is really wonderful. So um, we're happy about that. And we have a great team there right now. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear. Um... Our next question comes from uh, Judge Jules. Um, uh, do orangutans have different visual abilities than humans? Uh, I'm thinking color vision for spotting fruit. That's a great question. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what the orangutans are seeing, but they do have trichromatic vision just like we do. So presumably they're able to see the the full the spectrums that we also are able to see. So they should be able to see, for example, red fruit against the green background, unless you know they have a form of color blindness, like can happen in humans um, using the same mechanism. So all of the the apes, that, as far as we know, have trichromatic vision like we do. So they they should be able to see similar to what we see, although we don't know exactly uh, if it's exactly the same as what we're seeing. We have a, our next question comes from um, uh, Diane uh, from our website. And uh, she asks, uh, how often does the site experience rain or severe weather? 
Well, I think we, we, we actually we have a video of this, don't we? Yeah, we do. Do you want to show it, Ariel? Yeah. <laughs> you can see. Sometimes we get a lot of rain. So this is um, a big rain. And during the rainy season, we often are following the orangutans in this kind of rain and just getting soaked. And during the rainy season, it's pretty much like this most of the time. And we do have some dry periods, but that's why camp is up on stilts, as you can see. Um, so, and then during the dry season, it gets really dry. And so what we've been finding is, you know, about every three to four years, we get this like continuation of dry conditions and dry conditions. And sometimes we don't get very much rain during the rainy season. And that's when the site becomes extremely vulnerable to these fires. And typically that's linked to El Nino years or ENZO events. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, our next question we uh, have is from uh, uh, Ian. Let's see here. Uh, Ian asks, in low fruit periods, do you notice orangutans engaging in more carnivorous feeding behavior? Oh, that's a very interesting question. That's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that we have found um, just our preliminary analyses have shown that they do increase insect consumption during the low fruit periods. Um, so they're eating more, I guess that would be considered um, fats and proteins during these periods from insects. But um, feeding on meat is pretty rare in our population, um, at least from our database, there's only like four or five instances of feeding on, you know, eggs or lizards or small birds. And we do have one observation uh, that Christiana Merker, one of the Universitas Nacional students at our field site just published on slow loris consumption. So the feeding on another primate. So a hunting episode where one individual uh, killed and ate a slow loris. But I will say that it's very opportunistic and very rare at our site. That that sounds really really interesting. Again, like yeah, there's videos. Another... You should look it up. It was published in okay. Primates, and you can look at in the journal Primates, and there's a video uh, as part of that. So, Ooh. and if anyone doesn't have well, access, they can contact me, or we can okay. put it on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. We'll definitely. We'll get. We'll get people that because I think I think that's very very fascinating to see. Let's see. Here. Well, who is our next question from? It is. Um, is it uh, uh, David, or do we just have David? Okay, David. Okay. Uh, when will foreign researchers be able to come back to your site? That is a great question, David. Um, I was fortunate to be able to go um, not to do research, but to train Indonesian students with my graduate student, William Aguado. We were able to go and train students for a workshop in November. But in terms of research, we are hoping that uh, research will open up to foreign researchers within the next few months. Um, that's kind of the news that we've heard is that uh, foreign research is now for, uh, um, under a new government organization called BRIN. And we've heard that they're gonna be opening up uh, hopefully soon to foreign research. They are accepting new applications into their portal. So fingers crossed soon. Uh, our next question comes from Bob. Um, and Bob asks, uh, are you worried about the next big fire and what are you doing to prepare for it? Bob, I am always worried about the next big fire. I will say that's something that we all uh, are very concerned about. And so what we've done is we have a, a fire team that works for us year round. And we work very closely with the Borne and Orangutan Survival Foundation that co-manage uh, the research area. And they also have a fire team. And we work together in training these fire teams and working with them. So our fire team is always kind of going around, making sure all of these hundreds of hydrants are working and we have people on call in case we do have a fire. Um, really the best thing that we can do is talk about fire prevention and be alert. We've also bought, uh, been able to purchase a few drones together with the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. We have a bunch of drones now that we can fly over the area so we can detect, hopefully detect these fires a lot earlier now um, instead of just waiting for the smoke to pop up. So we're doing everything we can and using remote sensing more as well. Yeah, it's got to be just just horrifying um, to especially because I know, you know, during the last big fire, you weren't you weren't there and to not actually be able to be on ground on the ground, but to be able to help remotely is <clears throat> is incredible. Um, our next question comes from uh, uh, Domas Diana. Let's see here. Um, 
with the other focus of the Leaky Foundation, how common is uh, tool usage in orangutans? That's a great question. And most of the tool use observations for wild orangutans have been observed on the island of Sumatra um, and in the Swak Field Station that is uh, run by Carolina Shupley now and used to formerly run by Carl Venshike as well. There, this is a, a site, um, our site was kind of formed as a comparison with Swak. And most of the tool use has been observed in that area and in that region uh, where Swak is located. Um, in Borneo, um, you know, it, it's not that it doesn't happen. We have seen one occurrence of, a, of an orangutan using a stick to get honey out of a hole in a tree. However, I will say it's very rare. But then again, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So who knows? Maybe if we stay a lot longer, we'll still see, see tool use. But it's, it seems to be very rare and certainly not as common as we see in uh, Sumatra. But it's definitely more rare, I would say, in orangutans than it is in chimpanzee, in studies of chimpanzees. Well, we actually, we, uh, uh, Caroline Shupley was on Lunch Break Science. Uh, All right. Uh, so definitely check out that episode. We'll, we'll get that link in, in, the, in the video description later. Um, right. Our next question comes from Ronnie. Let's see here. Um, great talk, Aaron. Oh. Excellent observation already. Um, is there evidence that orangutan foraging patterns are similar to any extinct human species? If so, how can orang diet inform us about our own evolution? That's a great question, Ronnie. Thank you. Hi, Ronnie. <laughs> um, that's a really wonderful question. And, you know, it's really hard. We do know that extinct species were um, probably feeding on fruits and alternating between underground storage organs, which may have similar starch composition to some of the underground storage organs that orangutans are feeding on and some of the pith and vegetation that they're feeding on. So it is possible that early hominids did kind of fluctuate between episodes when they were eating more fruit and episodes when they were feeding on more, uh, more difficult to digest uh, vegetation, vegetative material. But one of the things we do know is that there were these fluctuations. And so presumably they experienced similar variation in the ecology that orangutans are feeding on, I mean, are experiencing. And so it wouldn't be surprising if just like orangutans and modern humans, they also were utilizing these other pathways of gluconeogenesis and really relying on protein and fat um, energy from protein and fat digestion or amino acid conversion for energy. But it's really, it, it's hard to know. Um, but what we do know is that they probably did experience a similar ecology um, in terms of this unpredictable variation over time. Um, Ian also has another question that's really good. So uh, uh, given the long in, uh, interbirth uh, of orangutans, what do you think the best approach is for maintaining high levels of reproductive success for the species, which is is very much tied to our theme today? Yeah, I mean, they do, orangutans reproduce every, I would say seven to eight years, seven to eight and a half years. Uh, kind of the recent study by my colleague Maria Van Norvik has shown um, and colleagues. And it's, I think that really just our presence and our long-term research that we're doing at these field sites is going to be really critical to protecting them. Um, it does seem uh, into continuing their, you know, their reproduction and, and seeing how many offspring that they are able to produce throughout their lifetime, because we still don't completely have an answer to that. I would say that, um, you know, there's nothing that we're going to do really to speed it up. But to speed up their reproduction, this is they just have a slow life history and they do even in captivity. However, I do think that, you know, the most important thing and the and the the best approach is just to protect their habitats and to continue studying them and involving the local communities in our research that we can come up with alternative livelihoods for the local community so that they're part of so that they're truly integrated into the research uh, projects that we're doing. Um, and the conservation projects that we're doing. My last question for you today is, do you have any advice for those who are just starting out or hoping to pursue a career in science? I would say for those of you just starting out, um, don't hesitate to ask questions. 
don't hesitate to contact professors. If there's somebody doing something that you think is cool, reach out to them, send them an email. And if they don't answer you right away, send that email to them again and say, you know, hey, I just emailed you. Can you get back to me or give them a call on their, you know, if you can find their phone number on, the, on their office phone. And when you're, if you go to college also, don't hesitate to ask a professor if they have research opportunities in their lab. Um, or if you can get involved in their research somehow, um, or if there's anything you can do to to integrate yourself into into learning about um, these different topics that you're interested in, because you can always approach a professor and always pr approach a graduate student and try to get involved in the research. Um, so I guess ask questions, ask to get involved, and really, you know, maybe put yourself out there a little bit, and and hopefully, you know, and I really do think that you'll see that faculty and professors are gonna be really responsible. And if you wanna ask questions, just send an email um, and, and get involved. And I, I, I think people are, at least all of the colleagues I have are really excited to engage students in, in research programs and to train students. That's what our, our goal is and what we wanna do. That is so wonderful. Um, and, and just such great advice to hear. Um, I do have something I wanted to share. Um, we have already raised uh, $350 today for um, the Primate Research Fund in honor of Earth Day. So match, that will be $1,400 to protect uh, primates and uh, support primate research. So um, if you haven't uh, uh, given and you would like to, this is a really good opportunity where you know your money is going directly to support uh, something really, really wonderful. Um, so again, just thank you all out there for for who have donated and and just and even those who have given us your time to watch the episode today and Aaron thank you so much this was just a wonderful episode thank you thank you Ariel it's so nice to see you again I always enjoy I our our little time together so it's great <laughs> I know any, any excuse we'll have to you know we'll we'll do something else too um, definitely okay, so, uh, next time on lunch break science. Uh, we are replaying episode uh, uh, 10 of Lunch Break Science with uh, Inesh uh, Childebeeva. Uh, so that will be a really wonderful episode. We uh, are also preparing for our 50th episode coming up pretty soon. We will be having back some, um, some previous speakers to be answering your questions about human evolution. So uh, we shared a link in the chat for you to uh, submit your greatest questions about human evolution. So they can be anything They can be related to past episodes or not. Um, so we're really excited to get your questions. So um, just, you know, thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. <laughs>